How's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining us on something a little new on Optimal Play. I'm Brandon. I'm here with my friend Steven. Hey. And Optimal Play so far has been about showing, uh, showing you and entertaining you with full games that show the stories and the fun that you can have with friends at the table. But there's another maybe not quite equally but important part of being a hobby gamer, and that's talking about games. So we're experimenting a little bit with something that brings a little bit more of that to the channel. And if you've been watching us at all, you know that one of our favorite games here is Arkham Horror the Card Game. So we figured what better way to start that off than with the Circle Undone expansion. A little review of the player cards, and then we might poke our head into the campaign log a little bit at the end just to see just the setup and kind of the flavor of the campaign. We won't spoil anything important. Uh, Steve, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm super excited for this box. I haven't looked at the spoilers, um, but I do know there's kind of a witchcraft tarot theme that seems really cool. Yeah, I'm excited for a campaign that's set in Arkham. Yeah, I think, yeah. Right. As far as we know, that's, <laughs> that's at least the at least all the setup that we've seen about it. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm sure we'll at least go to another country or another dimension. You know, one and or the other, but yeah. it'll probably be mostly Arkham. <laughs> I think if you go to another dimension, that's technically another country anyway. <laughs> yeah. So. So have you played one of these living card games before? I've played tons of them. Um, so uh, I used to play Netrunner. Uh, I played the Game of Thrones card game. Uh, this, yeah. this is actually the tournament uh, for all their uh, card games, all their competitive card games. I like it. It was a good choice of shirt for this. Yeah. Um, so, but Arkham is really fun um, because, first of all, you can play it with your board game friends, your card game friends. Uh, you can play it with people that are hyper competitive as well as people that aren't that competitive because it is a cooperative game yep. uh, and it has different difficulty levels for different skill levels so really easy to play with anyone i just love that a story unfolds and that's the point that's mm -hmm. what makes it so unique is that you're not the game doesn't even really use the words win and lose very often sometimes more lose than win but <laughs> <laughs> most of the time they sit down you're not going to be told that you, you're not going to be told that you won or lost you're just going to have a great time and some awesome stuff will happen um, before we get started on the player cards, I just want to say that we are big fans of Team Covenant, and if you're a fan of them too, you might notice that we've kind of uh, made an homage to them, kind of used their old format for reviewing player cards as a starting point for ours. I'm sure that we will evolve the format as, as we uh, get used to doing this and as we get feedback from the viewers, but uh, yeah, it might look a little familiar. With that, should we dive into the investigators of the Circle Undone? Let's do it! All right. Uh, starting as usual with the Guardian, we've got Carolyn Fern, who is making her return from the promo book uh, tease that some people <laughs> have been Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I haven't gotten any of the books, so I have not played with her. I got a couple and then decided that I wasn't reading them, or wasn't, or I read the first one and, and wasn't loving it, and I wasn't going to keep paying $15 for an investigator that I was going to get anyway, so... Cheers, by the way. Cheers. So I'm excited to finally play with Carolyn. She is the Psychologist, a medic with three willpower, four intellect, two combat, and two agility. Two combat? That doesn't sound like a guardian. No. <laughs> That's an astute point. She has a Seeker stat line. Like, I would almost not be surprised if that is exactly a Seeker's stat line. I'm not sure who it is. It's actually a little is, low but... for a stat line. It's, uh, I think it's one, one less hmm. than the average. True. Yeah, 11. That is, yeah. That is low. Eh, hopefully her uh, power and cards make up for it. Yeah. As a reaction, after one of your card effects heals horror from an investigator or ally asset, the healed card's controller gains one resource. And her Elder Sign effect says, plus one, you may heal one horror from an investigator or ally asset at your location. The mind is fragile, but through understanding, we can protect it, she says. Okay, so she's a support investigator. Yeah, yeah. Right? So she, I mean, the first thing you think of is that she'd be amazing with Agnes. You know, like just <laughs> pair her up with Agnes, right. heal her horror every turn, and then Agnes, you'll have all the money in the world. Or with mystics in general that are more likely to be taking horror as, as backfires from their shrivelings or... Yeah, or although I, I find with a lot of the other mystics, I'm more worried about the damage too, mm. like if they have such low hit points. Good, good point, good point. Uh, all right, I am curious about her deck building because I'm sure I've seen it floating around as people played her, talked about her from the books, and I forget. Guardian cards level 0 to 3, neutral cards level 0 to 5, 
and cards that heal horror level 0 to 5, and also up to 15 <laughs> other Seeker or Mystic cards level 0 to 1. My brain is bending a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty complicated. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. And uh, one last thing, no weapon cards level 1 to 5. So Thank you. She yeah. can take Machete, but she cannot take the upgraded 45 um, and any other level 1 to 3 Guardian weapons. Huh. No. Lo <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, okay, this is, this is hurting my head, so... <laughs> I don't know why, what? like, a machete is more in her philosophical right. wheelhouse, but, like, <laughs> upgraded guns, that's immoral. Uh, so this heal horror level 0 to 5, but then also Seeker and Mystic cards and obviously Garden cards, does that basically just mean she can take alcohol? She can take No, Rora? she can take Pete. She can take Pete is a big one. The, the horror healing Pete. Oh. Interesting. Because it heals horror off of him. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm excited to experiment with her. I don't know if I would play her solo. No, but... I don't think so. I mean, if you had some way to leverage a lot of money, I guess you could just do Forbidden Knowledge Pete, and then it's like she's Jenny, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> all right, all right. And I'm sure she can find things to spend money on, although she can't take the big guardian weapons, which is yeah. usually how they do it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to keep on moving and take a look at Hypnotic Therapy, her signature asset. It costs two and is a talent that says, as an action, exhaust hypnotic therapy, test intellect two. If you succeed, heal one horror from an investigator at your location. Then that investigator may draw one card. And as a reaction, after one of your other card effects heals horror from an investigator, exhaust hypnotic therapy, that effect heals one additional horror. So it doubles her horror healing and gives her a new way to heal horror if she passes an intellect test, which she can pretty easily do. Yep. Um, seems pretty good. I think, you know, if you're giving someone money, you want to give them more cards, too, so they can spend it. Right. I like it. It leans even harder into her power. Like, I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen anything yet that shows me how she tries to win the game instead of just <laughs> not lose the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and speaking of losing the game, her weakness is rational thought. It's a flaw. Revelation, put rational thought into play in your threat area with four horror on it. Horror on Rational Thought may be healed as if it were on Carolyn Fern. If there's no Horror on Rational Thought, discard it. You cannot heal Horror from cards other than Rational Thought. You cannot gain resources from her reaction ability. Okay, so that's everything. <laughs> While I take a sip, why don't you give us the conclusion on Carolyn, because I'm kind of baffled. Yeah, so first of all, it says you cannot gain resources from Carolyn's ability. Can you still give them to other people? Like, I don't know. Um... It does look like she can still grant resources yeah. to other people. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's oh, but oh, but you can't heal cards from you cannot heal horror from other cards, so you actually can't. There's no way oh, to do it. Oh, you couldn't. You yeah. couldn't trigger her okay. reaction anyway. So right. yeah, so it's pretty nasty. Although I mean, if you have ways to do multiple horror at the same time, if you have her signature, you'll you'll clear it twice as fast. So true. Um, yeah, so I guess the signature helps with it. Um, it, it it'll probably slow you down a few actions. It's so interesting, because all I'm seeing on all of these cards is just heal horror, heal horror, heal horror, screamed at me, and I guess, yeah, there's some extra card drawing and granting resources, but I'm not... There's no obvious archetype here, yeah, other so, than, like, as a support in a four-player team. I, I think, you know, other than Agnes, everyone else is going to have to kind of build around her a bit. Like, mm. she's the first investigator that the other investigators have to build around. Okay. So, for example, you, if you're playing Mark, you can take uh, the one that transfers your damage into horror, and then, so Mark is using Sophie, he's taking damage, then he's turning that into horror, and then Carolyn's healing it. So, like, there's a way to make it work, but, the, but Mark has to change his deck building to work with Carolyn. Right. Interesting. Okay. I can get behind that. Uh, let's keep it moving. It's a, it's a lot of cards to cover here. You want to give us Joe Diamond? Of course. So he's a seeker, so I'm sure he'll be much worse at fighting than Carolyn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and much better at investigating. Absolutely. Um, so Joe Diamond, uh, who's this sweet-looking uh, gun-shooting gun private eye, uh, has two will, four intellect, four fight, and two agility. So okay. kind yeah. of the reverse. The anti-Carolyn. Other than they agree on, on intellect. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Books are important. Stay in school. <laughs> um, so he has a forced uh, when the investigation phase begins reveal the top card of your hunch deck well they haven't explained what a hunch <laughs> deck is but huh, okay. I, I assume the other side does 
Uh, until the end of the phase, you may play that card as if it were in your hand at minus two cost. If it is still revealed at the end of the phase, shuffle it back into your hunch deck. And then his Elder Sign effect is plus one. You may move an inside event from your discard pile to the bottom of your hunch deck. All right, I think we got to pretty much keep moving to find out what the hunch deck is <laughs> before we exactly. say much more, right? Yeah. And he's right. eight health, six sanity. So he can take uh, Seeker cards level zero to five, Guardian cards level zero to two, and Neutral cards level zero to five. Okay, classic um, dual class investigator. Yep. Um, and his deck must include at least 11 inside events, including Unsolved Case, which I think is his weakness. Right. Um, and during the setup of each scenario, you must choose 11 inside events from your deck, um, one of which must be Unsolved Case, and shuffle them into a separate hunch deck. And you skipped over this, but deck size 40. Oh, yeah. So he has a full regular deck in addition to this hunch deck. And this hunch deck. Interesting. Okay. So, I'm going to have to go through and refresh my memory on what exactly Insight entails, but there are a lot of them. I yeah. Think, I think he's got a lot of options here. I think that like the auto grab a clue secret cards in Insight. Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe the draw three if there's, a, if there's a clue on your locations in Insight. And those are both two costs, so having it reduced by two is pretty handy. Right. He doesn't have any innate way, at least that we've seen, to play those cards fast. So yeah. I think that having fast insights in that deck will have a lot of value because you're a lot more likely to actually get that benefit even though there's more important things to do. Yep, yep. Um, and he doesn't have uh, any way to get like other factions insight. Like That might have been cool. Yeah, after seeing his, uh, his preview articles, I expected he would just be able to take all insights. Yeah. He can't. So that's interesting. Yep. Um, and gar Guardian level 2, that does let him get, um, you know... Vicious Blow 2 is a really good one. Beat Cop mm. 2 is a good one. So he could be a good fighter if you wanted. Yeah, I mean, I would hope with this many guns in his art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, as I was looking at the next card, speaking of which, what do we got up next? Yeah, so we have uh, Detectives Cult 1911s. And they're these sweet guns that are, like, holstered. Um, and uh, it's a Joe Diamond deck only. Use 4 ammo. Um, special sort of passive ability. Up to two tool assets you control do not take up hand slots. Hmm. Um, this itself takes up two hand slots. Uh, and then you can spend one ammo, fight, you get plus one attack, and deal plus one damage for this attack. Uh, if this defeats an enemy, you may move an insight event from your discard pile to the bottom of your hunch deck. To the bottom of your hunch deck, okay. That's only likely to matter if you shuffle your deck by not playing an insight some turn, right? Yeah, yeah. Or um, if your hunch deck has gotten low, I guess. Because um, I think... That's true. I just think of most games as having like 10 to 15 rounds. So for the most part, yeah, I guess you'll probably see it again mm -hmm. if, it, if it comes up or if you do this early on in the round mm -hmm. or in the game, rather. Yep. Uh, have we seen many tools yet? Uh, I think magnifying glass is a tool. So I think it works oh. well with seeker cards. Um, sure. What is a problem is that if you have your machete out, uh, this will overwrite your machete or your uh, 45. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, two hands, obviously, unless he... Uh, he can take Bandolier. <laughs> yep. <laughs> if he yep. needs even more hands, <laughs> which he might want. But, yeah, great point. Uh, take us through Unsolved Case. Sure. So this is his weakness, which is also an insight. Um, and it costs four. Um, but you're playing it from your insight deck, so it actually really only costs two. Uh, oh, good point. Place one of your clues on the location with the highest shroud. Remove the Unsolved Case from the game. And then forced, if unsolved case will be shuffled into your hunch deck, add it to your threat area instead. For the remainder of the game, it gains forced. When the game ends, Joe Diamond earns two fewer experience for the scenario. Wow. So when it comes up, you have to drop everything and play it. Yeah. It's, that That is rough if it, you do not play that. It's not like most characters that have, ta like we just saw in Carolyn, most that have task weaknesses have all the time in the world to complete them. Not Joe. Huh. And unless he's playing Dunwich where he's not earning experience anyway, <laughs> because it's Dunwich Legacy, that's a pretty big setback. And there's going to be some fun situations where it comes up at the end of the game, and the Joe player is like, I don't want to lose two experience, but the highest shroud location has one experience. <laughs> so it's like, do I deprive everyone else of one experience, or do I take a two experience hit? And oh. players are going to be arguing over that. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> 
I think that'll be fun. I know we would have some situations. <laughs> we would have some long arguments about that in our campaigns. Interesting. All right. Let's keep rolling to Preston Fairmont, our Ooh. rogue for the set. He's the millionaire. I think everyone named Preston has to be rich. Uh, yeah, actually. I've only known one, and he was. <laughs> Okay, right off the bat, this guy's interesting because he has one of each skill. So he, he's way better than Calvin. <laughs> he's significantly better than Calvin. Right, yeah, okay, well that's that's a feather in his cap because Calvin's tough but not bad, I think. He went badly for me. <laughs> uh, I noticed he's Silver Twilight traded. Which, oh. since this is a Silver Twilight themed campaign, I think if there's anything like Lola got in Carcosa where some investigators are treated specially in some mm -hmm. minor way, I think he might be one of them. Yeah, maybe. And he's a socialite. He says, anytime you gain one or more resources from a card effect, place them on family inheritance instead of your resource pool. We'll have to take a look at what that is. And his Elder Sign effect is plus zero. You may spend two resources to automatically succeed instead. My money, my legacy, my problem. Let me handle it in my own way, which better be paying for skill boosts <laughs> <laughs> from the looks Seems of it. Seems like it. He has seven health and seven horror. Let's take a look at the back and see if we can put these pieces together. He has a normal deck size, rogue cards level zero to five, survivor cards level zero to two. Okay, it's kind of the return of the, the standard, the core set style dual classes here. Mm -hmm. Neutral cards level zero to five. He uses family inheritance, lodge quote unquote debts, and a random basic weakness, and cannot have illicit cards, which is especially interesting for a rogue, because that's all their weapons, I think? Yeah. yeah. Is it literally all rogue weapons? I believe so. I built a uh, fencing fin deck. <laughs> nice, I like it. So if he is going to be fighting, he's using fire axes and baseball bats, right? Yep, that and, would that would be a way to do it. And I guess knives and kukri, because yeah, <laughs> yeah. everyone can take neutral cards. I have a feeling you're probably not going to be building him as a fighter. Yeah, unless, I mean, Streetwise can boost fight, I believe, so maybe. I thought that was intellect and agility, no? Oh, man. yeah, no, you're right, you're <laughs> right, yeah. Huh. Okay, I'm going to keep moving and take a look at Family Inheritance, because that's clearly key to this. It's his signature asset, Family Inheritance, a windfall or a burden. It has no costs because it's permanent. It's a boon, and it says, as an action, move all resources from this card to your resource pool. Forced, when your turn begins, place four resources from the token pool on this card. Resources on this card may be spent as if they were in your resource pool. Discard all resources from this card at the end of your turn. So he gets way more money than even Jenny does, but you have to either spend actions to keep it or spend it every turn. Yeah, so I think you're going to want to take the rogue cards that give you extra actions, because otherwise you're just going to have, like, two actions a turn. Uh, two actions a turn unless you spend them, and I'm seeing this as you're going to take a lot of talents and spend mm. most of that money yeah, on, yeah. on tests, That's right? Because true. otherwise he's testing at one. Yep. And he can take... I mean, he can take some static skill boosts, but he's not going to get anything above three that way. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, hmm. Okay, i got to say... I'm not the biggest fan of really relying on talents. Like, it's not, uh, it's not my play style to do a lot of temporary stat boosting, so I don't know if Preston's going to be my thing. Yeah, um, we'll see. Maybe we there's will. some new cards that support him. I like the cash management aspect. Um, and speaking of cash, I just flipped to Lodge Debts, his weakness, which is a packed event that costs 10. It says, oh, when you play it, remove Lodge Debts from the game. Forced, when the game ends or you are eliminated, if Lodge Debts is still in your hand, you suffer one mental trauma. Okay. Classic trauma on the line here. Yep. He spoke of bargains and of debts owed, yet they were clearly no monetary obligations. It's from... Oh, they're quoting their... Fantasy Flight's <laughs> quoting their own book now, <laughs> The Investigators of Arkham Horror. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, okay. So, three for three on Investigators' Weaknesses being, like, quest-style yep. stuff here, huh? He's just got to find an opportunity to spend 10. Hmm. Um, I guess that seems pretty straightforward. Just He's got all this money, you got to set aside a few of them for this. Yep. Uh, something like a... It's not sure, Gamble. What's the card that takes ten, five or oh, three resources? Hot streak. In? hot streak is what I'm thinking of. That one, you gain enough resources for this right there, so I would say definitely run that with Preston. Unless you just 
has that much money easily. I'd have to try him out, you know? He might just have 10 resources, no problem. I don't see that being easy. <laughs> he has to be spending them or the treacheries. <laughs> I've already finished him off by the time you yeah. have 10. Um, all right, want to give us Diana? Yeah, so she is a redeemed cultist. Uh, she's got a knife and a candle in her hands. Um, and she is uh, one will, um, three book, three fist, and <laughs> three agility. Um, so this is the fourth investigator in a row with like an unusual stat line. So everyone has either had bad stats or they've had like weird stats in different places. Yeah, and this is the weirdest place for Mystic to have a bad stat. One willpower, the likes of which we've only seen on Finn, is going to be hard to overcome. How does she overcome it? So, uh, so she's a cultist and she's Silver Twilight. So, you know, probably good buddies with Preston. And I assume, you know, Silver Twilight's probably a really fun club. Mm. All these characters are joining. Um, probably I'm, great guys. I'm sure Diana would tell you that if you asked her, yeah. Um, so Diana gets plus one will for each card beneath her. Okay, so she has a way to get up to a normal will. Um, and then mm. as a fast reaction, um, after a card you own cancels or ignores a card effect or game effect, if there are fewer than five cards beneath Diana, place that card face down beneath her. Uh, then draw one card and gain one resource. Limit once per phase. Okay, this is already like Carolyn. I'm seeing a strong defensive archetype here. Yep, although unlike Carolyn, you know, after a couple turns, she'll be like a pretty normal mystic. So she'll probably be able to shrivel some stuff. <sighs> Maybe. All right, let's let's uh, oh well, let's get to our elder sign effect and then yep. take a look at our deck building. So her elder sign effect is plus two. You may choose a card beneath Diana Stanley and add it to your hand. So that's basically the same as Safina's. Right. Yeah. Okay. So she can recover some of her cancel effects. And then she's got a very even seven seven uh, health and sanity. Um, then for her deck building, so she has a deck size of thirty five. So another unusual deck size. Um, oh, interesting. Not uh, not quite as big as Joe. Um, and so she can take Mystic cards level 0 to 5, Guardian cards level 0 to 2, and Neutral cards 0 to 5. So another sort of corset style one, mm -hmm. but kind of interesting that uh, this is actually the second one so far that has uh, Guardian as a subclass. Oh yeah, that is interesting. So 3 out of 4 investigators so far can take Guardian cards. Hmm, might be some fighting in this campaign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, and then, as additional setup, you begin each game with Dark Insight as an additional card in your opening hand. Hmm. Okay. And she has three... I don't, I don't know whether Dark Insight is going to be an asset or a weakness, because she has three cards. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So, um, Diane is actually one of my favorite investigators, like, as a character. She's... She kind of accidentally joined the Silver Twilight cults as a business person and then realized as it got weirder and weirder that they were had nefarious intent and is trying to destroy it from within, basically. Mm -hmm. The problem, like, the thing with her is, at least in, in at least one of the games, she's always had a really conflicted ability. Like, they haven't gotten her story across in the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember in Elder Tor, she has two abilities that are both good, but are completely anti-synergistic. She's like good at fighting and also can just automatically kill things without fighting. They make no sense together. I'm worried that this is similar here because Guardian cards... Like, I think she wants to be a fighter. She's got decent combat in Guardian cards and also Mystics all have combat spells. But do you take the weapons or do you take Shriveling? If you rely on Shriveling too much, she's not going to have willpower early in the game. And if you take the weapons, there's only so well she can do with them with three combat and you can't upgrade them past level two. I don't know which direction, I guess this is why she's interesting, but yeah. also it's a little bit of a paradox, I think. Although Mystics, you know, they often take a few turns to set up anyway. So, you know, if you're going to have to get out your Arcane Initiate and search for spells, you know, maybe it's okay that, you know, you, you're not really great at shriveling until turns three or four. Um, also, we've seen like Jim in the past sometimes has played both Machete and shriveling. So, you know, maybe she can do something similar. Um, I know personally, like, Ward of Protection is one of my favorite cards. Mm, um, and sure. so, yeah. you know. It's one of the best cards, probably. I, I kind of like the idea of, like, you know, with Diana, you just play it immediately. Like, you don't even think about it. You're like, the first thing that's even slightly bad, I'm going to play it. And then eventually I'm going to draw an Elder Sign and I'm going to get it back. And then I'll, the second time, maybe I'll save it for a really bad treachery. 
how many card cancel effects are there? How much of her deck is going to be just cancels? So there's Counterspell once you have some XP. There's That's Word of Protection. One. There's... So it's also... I'm, I'm blanking here. It's also Ignore. So right. uh, there's a card Defiant where it says I ignore this yes. symbol. Yes, right. Um, and it's weird because most of the time you don't really care whether it hits that symbol or if it hits like a zero or a plus one. Mm -hmm. But with Diana, you actually want it to hit the symbol that you said it's going to ignore so that she can put it beneath her. Does it have to hit that symbol to trigger her ability? You know, when she was previewed, that discussion came up and it does have to hit it. Uh, okay, I saw a little bit of that too, but I never saw the, the result. Yeah. Huh, that's rough. Okay. And I've got to think that somewhere in the stack of cards, there's some more options, too. Yeah. The You mentioned that most mystics take some time to set up, which is true, but they don't usually take... You can usually actively set up by getting resources and cards until you get what you need. Here you need her to get hit by thing, by particular things that she is equipped to cancel. It's going to be trickier. <laughs> yeah, could, could be trickier. Um, I think one of your first upgrades will probably be Ward of Protection 2, so that you don't have to wait for an encounter to hit you, but you can just cancel anyone's encounter. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, things like Fearless or Defiant, sorry, you can you can play on other people too. Mm -hmm. So definitely, I think, probably better in multiplayer. What, okay. I, probably card previews are not the time to ask rules questions, but do you know what happens if she draws multiple tokens and ignores one? Does that trigger? Uh, so ignores a card effect? Um, yeah, I think so. A um, card effect or a game effect. Like, I'm blanking on the name of it. Oh, but all of McBride, the ally where you draw a bunch? Oh, and Dark yeah, Prophecy, the, too. The thing with, so Dark Prophecy is what I was thinking of. The thing with assets is you would play, you'd put all these resources into playing someone like Olive, and then she would get essentially discarded. She would go below, beneath Diana. So it seems like mm. a, that seems like a problem. Yeah. That's what I was looking for was Dark Prophecy, where that's where you draw five tokens and ignore all but one. Yeah. Does that work? Oh. Do you know? Is that something that you can actively, no matter what the test, get that card under her? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious to see the ruling on that, because I think that's whether those effects, that, whether you can find enough effects that can just build her up in the first few turns, regardless of kind of how the game is playing out. I think that's going to be key to succeeding with her. So, Olive could still be worth considering, though, because if you are playing Defiant and you draw three with Olive, you're more likely to hit the one that you're ignoring with Defiant. So you could still, <laughs> you could still put De Defiant under her. And <laughs> good point. Yeah, play all of cancel with defiance to get two for. Uh, is this once per round? Yeah, once so you, per phase. You, you, you can't you, get you, them both. No, yeah, that. but you put defiant under her, and then all of stays well, out. And and you eventually get all of under her if you want to later. Okay. Well, that was. <laughs> there's a lot to chew on even without looking at her three signature cards. But yeah, let, let's get to those. All right. So the Twilight Blade is this sweet dagger. Uh, it says uh, Sanctum's Reward. Um, and it's an item relic weapon, um, so uh, she can't take C the she can't take Ellie, so she'll not be able to host it on mm -hmm. the uh, Seeker ally that hosts relics. Um, and it's Diana Stanley only. Uh, it's an action to fight. You may use Will instead of uh, Fist for this attack. So <laughs> I think you know early on you'll want to use uh, your regular attack, but then later on you'll want to use Will. So right there, actually, that kind of addresses what I was that paradox I was talking about. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Early, this transforms as she does. Yep. I like that. All right, there's more. And then it says, you may play or commit events and skills beneath Diana as if they were in your hand. As an additional cost to play or commit a card in this way, exhaust Twilight Blade. You cannot trigger Diana Stanley's reaction ability while playing or committing a card in this way. So you... Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that seems great. So you get those ward protections under her, and then you can, in the late game, when something's about to kill someone in your party, you can just cancel it again. Yeah, so I guess... So this last part is separate from the fight ability? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, there's so much text on here that it's a really thin break, but I think those are two completely okay. different abilities. I, I yeah. think that when I read this, I was thinking, like, oh, you, it lets you commit, like, Defiant to your stab mm. with the blade... But I was like, that's kind of a, a you know small use case. But yeah, if that's just a permanent ability separate from the fight, that makes it a lot better. That's the way I read this. That You're... makes more sense. That makes. I was I, thinking I like, think oh, so. this is kind of weak. And it's it's not without cost to play this again because you're permanently lowering her willpower. So I'm seeing this as like a last couple rounds of the game type of play when you'd want to bust those wards of protection out again. Yeah. Also, it is worth noting that she can only have five cards beneath her. So if if mm. you get to five. Um, you know, you might want to just spend one so that the next time you get it. Very true. Um, the actual fight, it doesn't do two damage. 
So, you know, it's probably just for mm. like those odd numbered enemies that you yeah. just need to. Yeah. You don't. So it, it helps preserve the shriveling charges, but it's not like an amazing weapon. It basically just takes your basic fight and lets you take the better of your two skills. Yeah. Which, okay. So uh, then we get to Dark Insight. So this is the one that she starts with. It's mm. a two cost event, it's an insight. Um, and then it's fast. Uh, play when an investigator at your location draws an encounter card or a weakness. Cancel all of that card's effects and shuffle it back into your deck. Do not draw a new card to replace it. Shuffle it back into its deck. Yes, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> For a second, I was like, deck. I'm shuffling other people's weaknesses <laughs> into my deck. This is madness. <laughs> okay, uh, and this is a reminder is the one that starts the game in her hand. Yeah. So. That, you know, that kind of makes it more like she has two will because you could cancel something right away. Um, and then the, uh, the really big thing here is this is, I think, the first way we've seen to cancel a weakness. It is, yeah. Other than the card that we'll eventually see that was designed in Arkham Knights, oh, if, it, if it makes it through playtesting. Okay, I wasn't lucky enough to get to that. Oh, yeah, that mystic uh, Ikiak, however you say that. The, the mystic, um, mystic ally that they designed there can cancel weaknesses. Okay. So... I'm sure she was designed before that, <laughs> if she's coming out now. Uh, this seems insanely good. This seems really good, yeah. It, to start with it in her hand, it costs two, so it's, it's, you know, it's not as cheap as Ward of Protection or something, but just to cancel a, not even just weakness, but an encounter card. It can be any enemy no, and any investigator at your location. Wow. <laughs> and then because she, starts this in, excuse me, because she starts with this in her hand, she has a way to get to two willpower no matter what, how bad her opening draw is. Yeah. Okay, I'm warming up to her. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I'm, I'm actually playing a campaign right now with a Calvin that has five physical trauma and five mental trauma. Uh, he will literally die the instant he draws his weakness unless there was a Diana with Dark Insight on his location. Um, I'm playing Mateo in that campaign. I'm sure he wishes I was playing Diana. I can't believe he's not retiring that campaign. <laughs> <laughs> he probably should. He probably should. But, you know, I mean, Calvin is just a very stubborn survivor. <laughs> and, you know, he's just going to look look the end times, you know, straight in the face and charge forward. When your own signature card is guaranteed to kill you, <laughs> it might be time to get out. <laughs> but, you know, he wants, to play, he wants to play Calvin until the end of time. <laughs> well, well played. All right, well, before I've warmed up to Diana too much, uh, what's her weakness look like? So her weakness is a madness. Uh, revelation, if there are no cards beneath Diana Stanley, shuffle Terrible Secret back into your deck. Otherwise, for each card beneath Diana Stanley, you must either discard that card or take one horror. Cannot be canceled. Hmm. All right. And she was, what, seven and seven? She was seven and seven, so she's not one of those ones that has like eight or nine right. uh, sanity. This looks rough. I'm seeing this as pretty easily if it comes up late game. Assuming you want to keep your willpower at at least four, it's going to do three horror to you. Yeah, yes. so I think it's, you know, you're probably going to have to manage how many you have underneath her until you draw this. Hmm. So, you know, if you draw the good signature first, you can try to spend some of them until you get through Oof. this. Once you get through this, you're like, all right, fine, I can just, you know, boost up. <sighs> I don't know if I'm sold on that. The average game you draw, like half to two thirds of your deck, there's a good chance you're never going to draw this. And if you played, if you played around it that drastically the whole game, just to never you draw know, I mean, it, that... having, having a terrible secret just gnaws on you. It does, and I know from playing campaigns with Doom, how it feels to play around, play very carefully around your weakness the whole time, and it can be fun. Yeah. But man, okay, that's a big setback. <laughs> yep. So, um, you know, uh, luckily Mystics, sometimes they just only draw through Arcane Initiate if they're lucky enough to get that. So, you know, that makes it a lot less likely she'll draw it. Um, of course, the uh, other signature is not a spell, but you could take Backpack, and you could just have Backpack to, to find this, and then That's Arcane true. Initiate to find your spells, and maybe you don't need to draw so much. I like the idea of a woman in cultist robes carrying her <laughs> ritual dagger and a backpack. All right, it's a good visual. Okay, I think I am both most skeptical and most excited to play Diana yeah, <laughs> of, of the investigators we've seen so far. I would say so far she is probably the most interesting, though I'm, I am curious how Preston will play. And then thematically, I just, I've always liked Private Eyes, so I'm, I'm mm. excited for Jazz. That's a lot of good stuff here. I'm going to take us on to Rita Young, the athlete. She has three willpower, two intellect, three combat, and five agility. Have we seen five agility yet? No, I think this is the first. Yeah, I guess if anyone's going to have it, it's her. <laughs> That's what she does in all the games, is she runs fast. 
even if it's across oceans or doesn't always make sense, but she does it. Uh, she's Miskatonic traded and has the reaction, after you evade an enemy, either deal one damage to that enemy or move to a connecting location, limit once per round. And an Elder Sign effect, plus two, until the end of the round, ignore the limit on the above reaction ability. Okay. That seems... Oh, well, so, first instinct on the Elder Sign effect is that is so niche, it's not going to matter in most games. <laughs> not only do you have to draw the Elder Sign, but you have to be evading multiple enemies that, ter that round for it to matter. Hmm. Okay. The power seems cool, though. Yeah, no, I think... Um... Being able to kill one damage enemies by evading them, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, if there's an odd damage enemy, you evade it, you do one damage to it, and maybe Leo or Mark cleans it up next turn. Um, you know, could be really good. Also, if it's not, if it doesn't have XP and it's not a hunter, you just leave it behind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is very much your style. Don't leave it behind if it has XP. But... <laughs> You're right, yeah. Survivors are good at doing just the bare minimum that they need to do to get by, and she's no exception. You got a bone to pick? Fine by me. I don't need your permission to leave you in the dust. Yep, that... that she does need my up. permission if the enemy has XP. <laughs> I know I can leave an XP enemy behind, and you will travel the map to go clean it up. She has a deck size of 30 and can take survivor cards, level 0 to 5, neutral cards, level 0 to 5, and tricks, level 0 to 3. And then she just plays her signatures, I'm done running, hoods, and a basic weakness. I haven't paid too much attention to the trick trait so far. Yeah, I think some of the like rogue events are tricks, so she can probably take you know a lot of the rogue events. Um, but I, yeah, I don't remember them all off the top of the hand. But you know, probably like sleight of hands, probably a trick, maybe yeah. double or nothing, hmm. um, maybe backstab. I don't know. You're right. I, I think that. Is probably the case. <laughs> it feels right that that's going to be mostly rogue cards. Hmm. Okay. She seems like the most straightforward. Like she's just got good stats and a clear. Like this is the area where she excels. All right. I and like it. There's got to be one in the box, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. And continues the theme uh, of Finn of like trying to make evade relevant because I feel like the first couple cycles you could sort of ignore evade if you wanted. Right. Yeah. It was definitely the. I mean, it's it's also a defensive stat from treacheries and things, but agility has really made a comeback lately, and I, I bet that continues. Taking a look at, I'm done running. It's a zero cost event that's spirit traded. Fast play only during your turn. Ready and engage all enemies at your location. Nice. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> For the remainder of your turn, whenever you evade an enemy, instead of exhausting and disengaging from that enemy you may deal at one damage. So, okay, it turns her evade into a fight. Yep. For the round, <laughs> essentially, right? Mm -hmm. She turns and fights. She's done running. Okay. I'm not uh, in love with it because I don't think that she's going to be building to kill a lot of enemies, but it's a good, like, emergency plan yeah and you know just thinking about combos um if you were playing with a mystic who had a seal of the elder sign you could give her her elder sign ability so so that for each of these evades she did one damage and then she does two damage for to all the enemies at her location um i mean it doesn't still... okay so it does trigger both those abilities yeah okay. yeah got it I was thinking that since you've chosen not to disengage and exhaust them, it might not trigger her built-in mm -hmm. damage. But no, it absolutely does. So it's actually two damage per evade in yep. the turn that you play this. This art... I wonder if this is the same... What's that rogue card with the guy that has the unnecessarily long legs? Watch this. <laughs> this reminds me of that. Her arms <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> look like double the length of her torso. I'm really curious if this is like the same artist. <laughs> yeah, it's a little doll ish yeah, it makes me wonder whether this is a like stylistic choice to mm -hmm. have characters with um, really gangly limbs. <laughs> Overall, though, I think it is a pretty badass pose. Like, oh yeah, I mean, and Rita is absolutely a badass. There's no question about that. Just, just, uh, just caught my eye a little. You won't see the eyes of these cultists under these hoods, though. They are a the first enemy weakness we've seen in a while. Humanoid cultist with threes across the board. They say, pray, Rita Young only. They're alert, 
So return of the alert keyword. Okay. Good for her evasion. And their hunter. <laughs> but forced, after you evade hoods, it attacks you. Okay, so alert and this forced effect means that they always attack you. <laughs> if you attempt to evade them, you're going to take damage and horror. So it's actually like the one time you have to turn and fight. Yeah, I kind of wish it was called You're Done Dodging. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'm done running. You're done running. Hmm. You damn cowards always cover your faces. You're just like the damn clan, always too scared to let people see who you are. From Ghouls of the Miskatonic. Huh. A clan reference right here in this game. <laughs> I know there are some of those through the Cthulhu Mythos literature, but I'm a little surprised to see that make it onto a card. Yeah. Especially, like, we don't know who Graham is, and Rita doesn't seem to be, like, a person of color, so I don't know if it's super relevant. I mean, Graham, I think, is the author of Ghouls in this okay. comic, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, that's an odd, an odd choice. Okay. There's a sixth investigator in this box. What? I know, right? Tell us about Marie. Uh, so she's another mystic. Um, and she's an entertainer. The entertainer. Um, she has four will, so she can just shrivel right, yep. to, right at the beginning. <laughs> I like that. Uh, four intellect, uh, one attack, and three agility. Uh, she's a performer and a sorcerer. And then while you have one or more doom among cards you control, you may take an additional action during your turn which can only be used to play spell cards or activate spell click abilities. Uh, and then her Elder Sign is plus one. You may add one Doom to or remove one Doom from a card you control. Uh, six health and eight sanity. So I actually did buy the Investigator's Arkham book okay. when she came with it, and I never tried her. And the I play mostly multiplayer, and uh, messing with Doom or like taking on Doom in exchange for benefits is not... Something I've really been willing to do in like three plus player games. <laughs> so I've actually been playing a Mateo with David Renfield mm. uh, in one of my campaigns recently, and it really hasn't been a big deal for me. Like I found, I don't know if I've ever actually caused the agenda to advance early. Like most of the time, I'm able to moonlight ritual it, um, and then sometimes I just kill David Renfield off. So you know, I th I think it's pretty solid. Uh, another underrated part of David Renfield is that. Uh, he helps, he has two uh, regular physical hit points, um, and mm. he boosts your will. So I find that four will oh, is yeah. really not enough to shrivel reliably, but five will is. Um, so I think she'll probably be taking Dev David Renfield, although there are two other allies, Arcane Initiate and Alyssa Graham, that can also put on uh, Doom. Right. I think... I mean, yeah, so David Renfield, also not a card I go for much for, for the same reason. But the fact that he's the only mystic ally that buffs willpower, yeah. <laughs> it's like, even if you never plan on using his ability, <laughs> still worth considering, especially because you're right, having several damage soak is valuable here too. Um, how does she build her deck? So she has a regular 30 card deck. She can take spell cards level 0 to 5, mystic cards level 0 to 3. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, neutral cards level 0 to 5, occult cards level 0. Um, and up to five other level zero seeker and or survivor cards. So another one of these <laughs> really complicated ones. At least there's nothing, no subsets of those ruled out. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no idea which occult cards are not mystic. I don't think there are any. It could be like Akachi when she started had this rule about taking cards with charges that like to start off with was only mystic cards, but they eventually put out other cards with charges. So maybe there will eventually be some non-mystic occult cards. Yeah, that's distinctly possible. I know when Marie came out with the book, uh, a lot of people, including myself, were speculating that, oh, she'll be part of, like, that was also right after the core set when the investigators were all, like, symmetrical and all kind of the same, and we thought, oh, Marie will be part of a box where all of the investigators can take occult cards, and there'll be tons of occult cards in that <laughs> uh -huh. box. Totally not the direction that the design of this game has gone. So now, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's mostly flavor. Kind yep. of like, well, I mean, I guess we've seen a couple now um, custom ammunition and things that Mateo can take because he can take blessed yeah. cards, but they're also, by and large, mystic cards anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see if anything comes of that. And then, as far as mystic cards that she can't take, um, the one I can think of right now is Grotesque Statues, a really good uh, level 4 mystic card that's not mm. a spell. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier Seal, Seal the Elder Sign, and there's a lot of fun... Oh, four, yeah, that's probably not a spell. 4 and 5 XP. Actually, maybe that is it a spell. It might be a spell. Mm. Not sure. I've never really thought of it as a spell, but yeah. okay, that might be. 
Hmm. Yeah, you're right. I, I think as long as she can take spells, she's not set back too far away. Yeah, but Grotesque would... Statue is definitely important. Um, if you've ever played a lot of Shriveling 5 without Grotesque Statue, very easy to go insane. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, all right, tell us about her mystifying song. All right, so her signature is a spell and a song. Um, mm -hmm. It's three cost, fast, uh, play when the agenda would advance by reaching its doom threshold. Until the end of the phase, the agenda cannot advance by reaching its doom threshold. Remove mystifying song from the game. So on the basis, on the opposite side of the coin that I don't like taking on a lot of doom because I feel like when I'm playing with multiple people it costs everyone too much, I love this card <laughs> for exactly the same reason. In a multiplayer game it gains so much. It can In a four player game it gains 12 actions. Yep. Um, I mean, 12 actions, it's not completely free because you do get to take another Mythos phase for that round. It's not like um, the Golden Pocket Watch. Mm -hmm. golden, yeah, the Golden Pocket Watch, right? That completely lets you take another Investigator phase. But yeah, this is pretty badass. Yeah, especially, I mean, I'm just thinking dream scenario. What if you have Scrying and you stack like three Ancient Evils in a row and then you play this <laughs> and then all the encounter cards for the turn do nothing? I can't condone playing Scrying. <laughs> I mean, I, I never would either, but that would be a dream. That would be pretty fantastic. And actually, yeah, uh, not that you can tech which investigator you're playing for a specific scenario, but things like the Essex County Express, where those ancient evils come out and screw you over time after time, that makes this even more appealing. You're absolutely right. And you actually technically can. Uh, there's nothing in the rules against just adding investigators to certain scenarios and then dropping them out. Actually. That's true, but the rules would not let you return to your old one with its XP. I don't think. I know. I actually asked this question, and I think it's, <laughs> it was originally designed for uh, you know if friends are jumping in and out. Mm -hmm. But technically, yeah, investigators can just jump in and out. I had never thought about teching my investigator choice <laughs> for scenario, but for this, I could consider it. And having played with you and watching you play Delve Too Deep <laughs> twice each scenario, no matter what the state of the game is, <laughs> it's good for that too. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So she has one of the rare weakness allies, if you could tell us about Baron Samedi. All right, so he's an avatar. Um, Revelation, put Baron Samedi into play. He cannot leave play while he has less than three doom on him. All right. Uh, forced, when any amount of damage is placed on an investigator in Baron Samedi's location, place one additional damage on that investigator. Um, so she only has six health, so that that's bad. Uh, and then as a fast action, you can exhaust him to place one doom on Baron Samdi, if he has three or more Doom on him, discard him. It's another quest. Yeah. That's the box. I think that's everyone everyone but Rita, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty tough because he'll never have three Doom on him, but he you will have to put two Doom on him for a while. Um, right. And you might you might want to wait till you draw the mystifying song before you put that second Doom on him. Yeah, or at least only tech, now that I know you can do this, only tech Marie into scenarios with large agendas. <laughs> so you've got, got time early on <laughs> to yep. get a couple do on the table and then get it off. Yep. All right, we finally made it through the investigators. We did it. <laughs> which now I'm excited for these. We can move on to the tarot cards, which are the, kind of for the first time, there's a theme across all five classes that is like a big, splashy, new mechanic in yeah. the box. I, I, I saw the preview, I thought it was super cool. So we're gonna look at kind of, I think, all at least the first five tarot cards at the same time. Uh, notably, there's a new tarot slot now. Yeah, first new slot. Yeah, so essentially what, that, what the existence of that slot means is you can only play one tarot card at a time. Because they are a leveled class card, that's true for a lot of investigators anyway. But they look like this. Uh, the Guardian one is Ace of Swords, Let Your Arrow Fly True, which I actually love the subtitles on these. Yep. These are great. It says, Tarot, it's just a stat boost. You get plus one combat. And it's got, when the game begins, if Ace of Swords is in your opening hand, put it into play. Cut to the heart of the matter. A good little pun with the sword. Um, let's move on and look at all these and then, and then talk about what we think. So, Death... Eight, the eighth tarot card, I guess. Three. Oh, that's 13. You need to practice your Roman numerals. <laughs> Damn it. Yep. Okay. All right. Now I'm already looking ahead at the moon. To, okay. I know what number that is. We're <laughs> to get there. All right. <laughs> Death 13. Oh, that's a more ominous number, too. 
It's a tarot card. You get plus one intellect. When the game begins, if it is in your opening hand, put it into play. Let go and embrace a new truth. We've got the moon XVIII. Message from your inner self. Same as the other two, but it's rogue and gives you one agility. The four of cups, chalice of the heart, is the mystic tarot and gives you plus one willpower. And the five of pentacles, the seeker tarot, is a little different because they've run out of stats at this point that they can buff. You get plus one health and plus one sanity. It is time to rise up again. And all of them have the same when they begin in your opening hand. Put them into play. What do you think of this? Uh, this seems pretty strong. I have a feeling that, you know, probably everyone's going to want one or two of these. So, yeah, I know there's been a lot of buzz on these. And if there's one thing that people who talk with me on Discord know, it's that I am a buzzkill. I, I think they're more niche than people are giving them credit for. I think costing three... They're fine if you don't draw them in your opening hand, but costing three to give you a static stat boost, like it's not as good as most allies that give you for about that same price of stat boost and another ability, and soak damage or horror, and have skill pips on them, which none of these do, by the way. Yeah. So it's something that, like, I think if you're if they're in your deck, you need to hard mulligan for them. Mm -hmm. So if you're an investigator that already needs to hard mulligan for things like your shriveling mm -hmm. or or thing or. Your, your, your weapons or your intellect boost or something, that's already a problem because you can only hard mulligan for so many different things. Yep, that's true. And then the fact that they're 1 XP. You know, they're not in your opening deck. You have to invest in them. They have an opportunity cost there too. So the fact that they have a slot makes you... My brain go to, like, usually when I build an investigator deck, by default, I'm like, let's put in something for every slot. Yeah. Because you might as well. Like, not arcane slot for a lot of people, but try to have an accessory, try to have a body slot if there's one that makes sense in your deck. Definitely an ally. So my, the terror slot tells my brain, yeah, play two of these. I'm not 100% convinced, but I'm interested to try them out. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the most obviously overpowered one is Five of Pentacles will be a two of in every Calvin deck. <laughs> till the end of time. <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> that is just a ridiculous card for him. Yeah, that's nuts. You're absolutely right. Being able to get his skills up to six. Six and six. <laughs> and hey, now that this is released, before you continue that campaign with your five trauma Calvin player, <laughs> he can... No, no. So we looked it up. Uh, trauma kills you when trauma equals your printed health. Oh, so the trauma would still kill him. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so that's very good in Calvin, and I could see. I kind of like these in um, Wendy and Ashcan because they're the only ones that can actually make use out of it. If you don't get it in your opening hand and you don't feel like spending three resources, mm. um, so like Wendy could maybe take. She probably doesn't actually care about the Five of Pentacles, but she might take the Moon, and then if she doesn't get it in her opening hand, she just uses it to redraw a token. You know, that's a great point. Anyone that has a built-in or, or cards that let them discard for an effect. Um, that adds a lot of value to these. Yeah. There is one neutral one. Want to give us the Ace of Rods? Yeah. So it has a fast ability during your turn. Remove Ace of Rods from the game. You may take an additional action this turn, during which you get plus two to each of your skills. And then it has the same when the game begins effect. So it's a police badge on a neutral tarot card. Yeah, the police badge is two actions, and you can give it to someone else, so... Oh, this is just you. Good point. Yeah. Hmm. This one is definitely the hardest to evaluate. Yeah, it's certainly. The value of extra actions are going to really vary from investigator to investigator, and from situation to situation. And then... Three... Man, I think this is the one that is the most obviously worst if you don't get it in your opening hand. Spending three resources and a card and an action to play it just to get two actions back. Yep. That's, so I mean... Maybe this one also goes in Wendy with Will to Survive. You don't actually use the plus two to your, each of your skills, but you get one more guaranteed action. True. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, I'm excited to play with these. And I think they're. it's super cool that we got this, like... Really, this is the first time we've gotten a really splashy cycle of cards that it's kind of like CCG style. Like one in every color, everyone gets one. It's a brand new mechanic. It's something that's 
cool. It even has a name. They're tarot cards. I'm really excited that like this game is seeing this kind of thing. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of releasing a whole theme all at once. Yes. So, you know, they could have done it where the first box has the Ace of Swords, and then the first <laughs> pack has the Death, and the, the second pack has the Moon. The Lord of the Rings LCG, absolutely. <laughs> that would be the way this happened. And it would be super frustrating. Yeah, totally. Because, you know, especially if they are good, then it, you know everyone who's not playing Guardian is mad that, oh, why, don't, why does Guardian have their tarot and I don't have a tarot yet? Right. Um, so yeah, just give it all at once. I like how they did that. For sure. So there is one more tarot card. Yeah. But it's a basic weakness. Ooh. The tower... 16? Good 16. job. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. I'm learning. <laughs> this has been educational. Circumstances beyond your control. It's an omen and a tarot. You cannot commit cards to skill tests while the tower is in your hand. If the tower is drawn in your opening hand during setup, before or after taking a mulligan, you cannot replace it. It must stay in your opening hand. <sighs> to me, this has the hidden text, don't play tarot cards. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think right? <laughs> if this is your weakness, you cannot play tarots. Um... It costs four to get out of your hand. And you can't choose to overwrite this with a good tarot, right? Like, it's just there permanently? Um... Yeah, I guess not. You can't get rid of a weakness, so you have to play it, and you can't commit skill cards to skill tests until you do. And then once you play it, if there were any tarot in your deck, they're either discarded when you play it or never going to see play. Yeah. Well, okay, if this is your basic weakness and you really want to play tarot cards, just pick a different weakness. <laughs> we won't tell anyone. No one's going to judge you. Well, I can think of some people who would judge you, but I won't. Um, yeah, and the other thing, so normally you can't build your deck around what basic weakness you have, or at least you're not supposed to, unless yeah. you're, you're fudging it a little bit. But because the tarots are all leveled up cards, you will absolutely know when you're deciding how to build your, how to spend your experience, whether you have the tower already. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a bummer that they put out the cool new mechanic and they put out a basic weakness that says, you definitely can't <laughs> use the cool new mechanic. Yeah, totally. But, um... Yeah, all right. I'm excited to see how it goes. <laughs> we finally made it to the actual player cards. I think that they are all level zero because the tarot is all of the leveled up cards in this box. Looks like it. Want to introduce us to the guardian cards? Sure. Uh, so the first guardian card, it's a two cost uh, tactic and insight called interrogate. Um, so this already sounds like it's going to be great for Joe Diamond because it's a two cost <laughs> insight. Yes, you're right. Uh, it has a parley. Uh, choose a humanoid enemy at your location and test attack four. This test gets plus X difficulty, where X is the chosen enemy's damage value. Uh, if you succeed, discover one clue at your location and one clue at any other location. I think that was combat three. Did you, did you say four? Three. Yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> um, hmm. Plus difficulty based on the chosen enemy's damage value. So I love that it doesn't say non-elite. It just yep. has a clause that makes it probably worse against elites. I think that's very cool because it's frustrating when nothing works against elites and there's elites in almost every scenario. Yeah, they also they found a way to make a card that's like detective themed that basically only the two detective characters can play. <laughs> <laughs> huh, that's a great point. <laughs> so yeah, I think... Um, well, I guess, I guess all the Guardians could play it, but the... The detectives do love it. Um, yeah, because you get to, the, the, especially the, the clue at another location, that can be tough. Um, there's all, Every map has like that one location that's just a pain in the butt to investigate. Yeah, whether it sucks to enter it or it has high shroud. Discovering a clue at another location is super valuable. And Seekers had a few ways to do it, but none of them have been that compelling. Like they've all been hard enough to pull off that that seems really difficult. I can see with you know a, with a, one of our you know one of our detectives with at least four combat plus probably a static boost. This is pretty reasonable to get to pick up one of those clues from across the map. Yeah, um, and parleys do not cause attacks of opportunity, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, you don't have to evade the enemy first or anything like that. I like the art too. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh... Oh wait, I thought he was holding a gun. He's no. actually just pointing his finger, yeah. which actually kind of makes me like the art more because I think that's cool that it looks like a gun until you look closely and then it, he's actually just screaming in this guy's face. Yep. <laughs> Very cool. Next is Delay the Inevitable. It's another insight. 
and also a spirit and a tactic. A two-cost guardian event. Fast, play during your turn. Attached to an investigator at your location, under his or her control. Have we? I'll finish reading. As a reaction, when you are dealt damage and or horror, discard delay the inevitable and cancel all damage or horror just dealt. Forced when the mythos phase ends, you must either spend two resources or discard delay the inevitable. Is this our first, um, for, for lack of a better term, because I used to play magic, our first enchant investigator? <laughs> our first card that attaches to investigators? Yeah, that, that does seem like it. I think it is. This is really interesting. I have not seen this yet, so I'm... So... I think I like it because there are a lot of times when... You, so because of this ongoing cost to maintain it, you really want to play it when you can see that damage or horror coming. And a lot of the time you can. Yeah. Someone just needs to tank a boss for a round, or you know that they're going to need an opportunity attack, or take an opportunity attack so that they can move to that location and resign, something like that. It seems pretty strong. Yeah, so, I mean, you can also just play it on yourself and just tank a bunch of damage. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems really good. I like how it ties into two different investigators that came out in this box. Yes. So, you know, it's a two cost insight. So obviously Joe Diamond. Um, but this also seems like something where you're really using the resources that Carolyn's generating. Um, Cause mm. you know, there's a way to build Carolyn with Pete and Forbidden Knowledge where she's making a ton of money, but you have to convert that money into an actual win condition. And hmm. preventing all your other investigators from taking damage, that's a great, you know, way to contribute. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was missing the fact that you could keep spending resources to keep this preventing damage indefinitely. Yeah. I actually thought that it was going to go away the, like, the, go away the first time you, that it took damage and horror, and you were just paying, like, until that happened. Okay, this seems awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Two resources per turn to be invincible? Yeah. No, so, wait, 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 wait. It does say discard. When you're adult, they oh. or discard delay the inevitable. Okay. Okay. Darn. Yeah. No. So it's not just a not just a pay the tax every turn to be invincible because that started to seem insane. Um, yeah. I think you just want to play it ideally the turn that yeah. that big like Yog Sothoth attack or something is going to happen. Yeah. Still, still very good. It's sort of like a preemptive dodge. Um, so you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think it's like over the top crazy, but yeah. it looks like fun. It's got more awesome art <laughs> as this lizard creature stretches out its tongue to get the person holding it back. Um, okay, I'm, I'm excited about the insights that we're seeing here. Yep, and then the last card's a skill card called Steadfast. Um, it's innate, uh, and while you have five or more total remaining health and sanity, Steadfast gains a will and an attack. Uh, while well, you have 10 or more total remaining health and sanity, Steadfast gains two of each of those instead. There's a fine line between bravery and foolishness, all right? First reaction, I don't like it. <laughs> I like cards that get more powerful later in the game, not cards that get less powerful later in the game. Yeah, and... Like, the desperate skills, they were there when you needed them in a clutch moment, and this one is decidedly not there when you need it in a clutch moment. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's it's supposed to be a Carolyn card. It's like she's mm -hmm. just constantly healing herself, and you know, so she has plenty of health and sanity left at the end of the game, and she True. can give people three three. Um, I don't know that I would play it outside of Carolyn. That's a good point. She can pretty reliably keep her, I guess, like not necessarily her health, but her combined health and sanity number up by her healing her own sanity. So true. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely run this in Carolyn at least to give it a try, but. Probably no one else. Yeah. Okay, that takes us to Seeker with their four cost, excuse me, their four cost asset, the fingerprint kit. Hey, it's a tool. Oh, okay. As well as an item. It uses three supplies and it says action, exhaust fingerprint kit and spend one supply. Investigate. You get plus one intellect for this investigation. If you succeed, you discover one additional clue at your location. And it takes a hand slot. Joe Diamond card, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, he, he can hold it with his guns. Um, plus one intellect is good because um, he's only at four, which is good, but it's not like Daisy good. Um, yeah, seems seems pretty strong. And honestly, do, I think I could see this comparing favorably to Flashlight for a lot of investigators that can take level zero seeker cards. Mm -hmm. It costs a little more, so it would have to be someone who's not too strapped on cash. 
but plus one to your investigation instead of minus two to the shroud. So it's a little less of a buff, but getting an additional clue is a pretty good payoff. Yeah, you know, I wish like Preston could take it because, mm. you know, obviously the four resources wouldn't be a problem for him. But Jenny could take it, and it seems like it'd be pretty good in her. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. I think this is going to get a lot of play. I think this is the best card we've seen yet. Yep. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, Connect the Dots. It's a four cost seeker event, it's an insight. So really only two costs for Joe Diamond. It's fast. I think you were saying how fast insights would be really important. For yes, Joe. although this one's expensive, so it's got that other aspect of using it timely. Uh, it's play after you discover the last clue at your location. Discover two clues at a location with a lower printed trad value than your location. Uh, the flavor text is, they thought you were being unreasonable, paranoid, delusional. Turns out you were right <laughs> all along. <laughs> Damn right I was. This card seems great. Yeah, it seems really fun because it's the first one that really makes you think about like what order you tackle locations in. Yes. It's, I think, obviously a great option for Joe. Again, it's, a, yep. it's an insight. It's fast. It, it, it does come with, the, with another caveat to playing it. It's fast, but play after you discover the last clue at your location is, especially in multiplayer, like not something that's easy to manage when it comes up and to have it line up with when it comes to the top of Joe's Insight deck. Yeah, I mean, I almost wonder, do you think there's some build that uses the Seeker cards that like drops locations, drops clues on your location? You know, maybe like do a little mm. combo, Wombo? Hmm. Probably not, but I do like combos. So you take you take all the clues off the location, then drop one and pick it back up so that you can play Connect the Dots? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, you know, actually, discovering two clues, at least in a lower player count game, where two clues is potentially all of the clues at a location, that, and then you don't even have to go deal with that location, that might be worth it. Yeah, so you can play like William T. Mallison, and there's like a event that cancels an encounter, and you drop mm -hmm. a clue. So, yeah, it could, could be a little strategy. There are going to be a... a I'm thinking of Essex. Are, are there any other scenarios that this is completely useless in? Because there are no other revealed lo clues that you want when you uh, finish off a location. I would say like where Doom awaits. Like a lot mm. of the, a lot of the map, there aren't really any clues. Yeah. Out. Um, but there, there's a lot of secret cards that probably aren't that good in where Doom awaits. That's a good point. <laughs> that's that's where you switch to Marie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that takes us to the last seeker card. Curiosity is the seeker skill. I notice everyone has a skill in this box. It has a willpower and an intellect icon. It's innate, and it says when you have four or more cards in hand, curiosity gains another willpower and intellect icon. When you have seven or more cards in hand, curiosity gains two willpower, two intellect instead. What if you are the cat? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, it's... Interesting. We'll see whether the other skills are like this, but I see the like the mechanical tie to Steadfast. Yeah, I, I like it more than Steadfast because Steadfast mm -hmm. seems like it's really a Carolyn card. You know, almost every Seeker uses higher education, so they yeah. have to be at five cards anyway. So this seems like a lot of Seekers will take it. Yeah, that is both why this card is great and why I think it annoys me a little bit is higher education is already ridiculously strong. <laughs> <laughs> so more cards that clearly go in that same archetype that are also very good. Man, higher education seekers are going to, <laughs> are going to be powerful. Yeah. <laughs> On the uh, the you know what um what skills does higher education give you? It gives it's you these same these two. same ones. So, so that is the one thing is it's kind of redundant. Yeah, but you can give it to someone else. So it lets your mm. higher education pass on their ridiculous will and intellect to other investigators. That's true. Or it can just be in your deck while your deck is level zero and you don't have higher education yet, so you can be benefiting from all the card draw you put in. Yeah. And then eventually you get higher education after the first scenario or the first four Dunwich mm. scenarios, and uh, <laughs> and then maybe you can replace these with something else. Hmm. Very cool. More connecting. Yeah, so uh, we're going on to the rogue cards. Uh, we have a two-cost asset called Well Connected. It's a condition, limit one per investigator. Uh, fast action, exhaust Well Connected. You get plus one skill value for this skill test for every five resources you have. Huh, I wonder which investigator this is for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the guy in the art just holding a wad of money. <laughs> <laughs> Might be another hint. <laughs> Sometimes who you know is more important than how good you are. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay, I like it. This does give you a reason to actually click to take the uh, resources off of uh, Preston's signature. 
Because I don't, I don't think the ones on does. him count for this. You're right. Yeah. So this, yeah, this encourages you to make sure that you're amassing those. I mean, his own cards do too. His weakness, especially, mm -hmm. it goes well in a Preston deck because you probably are sitting on a huge stockpile of resources yeah. anyway. And, and then and, I was gonna say, go like ahead. Jenny can also get rich, and Safina potentially as well if she takes like hot streaks. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think. This could be in a number of uh, rogue decks. I think a lot, most of these cards, these, uh, I don't know if they're always condition traded off the top of my head, but we're seeing more and more of these assets that take up no slots and boost your skills during tests for something other than spending resources. And I think they've pretty much all been really good. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a big fan of High Roller, which is an, another rogue one. Yeah, I mean, the last campaign, Forgotten Age, had a bunch of them, but I think they all took XP. So. Yeah, maybe so. So this might be the first level zero one. Okay, very cool. Money talks. I, <laughs> we're seeing a theme here. <laughs> it is a, although this is a little off-brand for Preston, it's a zero-cost yeah. event. It's a favor and a gambit. Fast, play when you initiate a skill test. Instead of the skill type indicated for this test, in parentheses, one of the four skills, this is a resource skill test. Your base skill value for this test is equal to half the number of resources in your resource pool rounded down. You can't buy happiness, but you can buy pretty much everything else. <laughs> Is this good? <laughs> uh, let's see. So in order to get to like five skill, which mm -hmm. is like a very good skill, you have to have 10 resources. Um, but maybe, yeah, maybe you just always are at like 10 or 15 resources with Preston. Like maybe you take Well Connected, you take Dario El Amin, mm -hmm. who gives you a stat boost when you're at 10 resources. And yeah, I mean, if you're going to always be at 10... A stat boost which doesn't apply when you play Money Talks. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but it at least makes you a little bit less crappy when you're not playing it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think maybe Preston just always has to be really, really rich or he's helpless. That's clearly the support that we're getting for him, is just he sits on mounds of money and just gets benefits, not even for spending the money, but for having the money. Which is cool. I like that because it just plays really differently from anything else we have. Yeah. I don't know if it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I just like the theme of just Preston being just so crappy at anything unless he can throw money at it. Yep. Like, you know, it's definitely we've all had that thought about rich people we know, you know? Like, <laughs> oh yeah, that person, like, he just buys his way out of trouble. Yeah. You're right. It is really the <laughs> the way you want to see a millionaire reflected in the in the mechanics of the game. <laughs> That's great. All right, is uh, is cunning a Preston card too? Uh, so let's see. This is uh, the rogue skill. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a woman with a gun, so it's not Preston himself. Um, <laughs> it's innate. Well, while you have five or more resources. Okay, sounds like a Preston card. Cunning gains uh, intellect and agility. While well, you have ten or more resources, cunning gains intellect, two intellect and two agility, and it has intellect and agility. So yeah, still still a Preston card. Um, with you know maybe Jenny, maybe some um, Safina. Uh, the flavor text is, don't worry, she insisted, I can handle it. Oh, okay. So this mm. is the woman that you handle to fix your problems. <laughs> <laughs> this is the woman that you handle? <laughs> <laughs> that you hired. <laughs> that you hired, <laughs> that, may... <laughs> that sounds a little better. <laughs> okay, so... While you have five or more resources, it is like around around as good as an unexpected courage. Mm -hmm. It's really, really good when you have ten or more resources. So again, this feels like Preston, maybe Jenny, probably no one else. Yeah. I'm having hmm. These road cards are pretty narrow. That's I like that they're providing like a new archetype for the game, but at the same time, they're not gonna bring skids to like back from the, <laughs> back from the grave. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, I think like Finn's not very interested in any of these cards. Um, skids probably not. <laughs> so um, but you know, at least they're they're trying to give Preston some support. And I'm definitely interested to try him. Yeah. No no idea if he'll be, you know, super competitive, but Luckily it's cooperative, so <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what supporter mystics get. I uh, think, uh, oh, it's my turn to read. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Scotch. <laughs> Deny existence. It's a spell and a paradox. A zero cost mystic event that says fast. Play when an encounter card or enemy attack would cause you to do one of the following. 
choose one. Discard cards from hand, lose resources, lose actions, take damage or take horror. You ignore that aspect of the effect. Hmm. Each other aspect resolves normally. So obviously this is support for Diana. Yeah, so she triggers when you ignore a game effect, right? Yes. When yeah, when you cancel or ignore a game and a game excuse me, when you cancel or ignore a game effect. So this this clearly works with her. It's great because it's zero cost, meaning that like when you draw that uh, oh, it's not an elder sign that lets you play the card from under her. It's her signature asset. But uh, it lets you play it twice for st for nothing no, at all. No, elder sign lets you draw it from under oh, that's... her. The signature lets you play it from under her. Thank you. Her. Yeah, so it's a great thing to recover with your elder sign because it's not going to put you out any resources yeah. to play it over and over and over. And pretty much every spell does one of these things when it backfires. So, like, basically oh. you just have to use a spell once and have it backfire. Actually... Encounter card or enemy attack doesn't include oh. your spells. Yeah, no, so you can't trigger this yourself. But this list of effects, discard cards from hand, lose resources, lose actions, take damage or take horror, that is like 95% <laughs> of encounter cards yeah, <laughs> make true, you do true. one of those things. So I was saying that Diana needed to be able to get some really early cancels. Like, I think this allows it. Yeah, yeah, it's zero, it's a spell, so you can find it right away with Arcane Initiate. Yeah, seems probably a two of an every Diana. Eldritch Inspiration. All right, what's another we, what's this for? One. Zero cost event. It's Spell and Spirit. Uh, fast. Play when you resolve an effect on a Mystic card that triggers when any of the uh, you know symbols, uh, non-number symbols, are revealed. Mm -hmm. Either cancel that effect or resolve it in additional time. So this is what hmm. I was what I thought deny existence was. It cancels <laughs> all the stuff on the spells. Right. This is this is what you want to deny existence to be. You're absolutely right. Okay, um, cool. I think I like it. None of the spell... Hmm. Most of the spell backfires aren't so substantially bad that I feel like I need to devote deck space to canceling them. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Diana probably wants this. Sure. Um, maybe some mystics that want to go, like, right for Shrivel 5 really early maybe want it, because 2 horror can be pretty rough. Right. Um... But I think if I was a mystic that went right for Shrivel 5, as soon as I had the XP, I would upgrade this into Grotesque Statue. Um, and the resolve an additional time. So what are some good effects of that? Song of the Dead, maybe? Does it let you double the additional damage from the skulls? I think Song of the Dead would. I Oh, I was going to say Agnes could take horror twice, but that <laughs> it's actually once per phase on her trigger, uh, so, yeah, yeah, so that won't work. work. I'm not sure we have seen it all that much else that you would want to trigger mm -hmm. on your spells. I'm sure I'm missing one, and I'm sure people will let me know in the comments what it is. Yeah, so... But, uh, but you could do five damage with a single Song of the Dead, so... You know, that is pretty cool. True. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. All right, before we move on to the Mystic skill, I haven't looked at it yet, have you? Nope. I'm curious if we can guess what it is, based on the last three have had a really clear commonality. It probably scales based on something, and it probably scales based on something good versus something bad, like having a lot of horror on you. Mm -hmm. Maybe the number of spells you control? Number of spells you control? I mean, Any all guess? The... Number of spells you control... Um, I mean, number of cards under you would only apply to Diana, so that doesn't make sense. No, that can't be it. Um, and Safina, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sure, we can go with that. Okay, all right, that's the official optimal play <laughs> prediction. That's not it. Oh. <laughs> Prophesy, it's a mystic skill with a wild icon. It says practiced. While there are three or more Doom in play, Prophesy gains wild, another wild icon. While there are six or more Doom in play, Prophesy gains two wild icons instead. Okay, so my prediction that it would be for, like tied to something you're doing well is not necessarily true here, although it could be that you've stacked 61 Renfield. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somehow. And, and I think we kind of forgot, these first two are clearly Diana cards, we forgot that there was another Mystic, and this is clearly a Marie card. <sighs> Good point. Yeah, this, this is... You're right. I was going to say I don't think I would ever play this, but I think if I were to play Marie, I would probably play this. It's so... So it's only better than Unexpected Courage when there are six or more Doom in play. 
And yeah. some scenarios don't even let that happen. Yeah. And then the ones that do, it's like only for a window of a couple rounds where this is even all that good. And I mean, even though a lot of the time when there are three or more doom in play, it's just as good as an unexpected courage, which is good. Maybe you just want more than two unexpected courages in your deck. Well, but... keep in mind though, so Marie can use Blood Pact four times because she gets four actions. <laughs> so <laughs> huh. she can uh, like use Blood Pact like three times, um, then commit this, uh, and then on her fourth action, play Moonlight Ritual. And so you don't even advance, even though you had like a million deal in play. Hmm. That's a great point. I don't even remember what stats Blood Pact boosts. Uh, use... Will and attack. Okay, so she'd be using that to fight or like if she had Right of Seek. When you, when you say, great, you can pump your skills for all three actions, I usually think investigating is the time you'd want to do that. I get fighting. Uh, shriveling, you know, like shriveling a big enemy. Like yeah. That. It would have to be a pretty big enemy for you to need three shrivels. <laughs> <laughs> but good point. Okay. All right, and that would be fun to pull off. You're, yeah. you're a combo. <laughs> you're an established combo liker. You... <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, like, the fact that you have to work that hard for it to get a little bit better than un Unexpected Courage, like, eh, probably not the yeah. going to go in a lot of decks, but it's, it would be fun to pull off. For sure. That takes us to Survivor. All right, so... Oh, always last, never least. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a three-cost asset, Track Shoes. Um, they look like your typical soccer cleats, except the cleats are a little longer and they're kind of bloody. Um, like, they're, they're quite bloody, yeah. Yeah. They're bloody on the top and bottom of the shoes somehow. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> you know, soccer fans tell me that it's a violent sport and, you know, I guess, I guess they're right. Um, <laughs> I didn't so... know it was that bloody or that violent, but yeah. you know what? I'm an American. What do I know about soccer? Yeah. Uh, item, clothing, and footwear. Uh, limit one footwear per investigator. So hmm. we just got Taros, which is like a real slot. Mm -hmm. But then this is a, a new, I think people call them like phantom slots, where it, it acts like a slot in most ways, but not always. Um, it permanently gives you an additional agility. And then there's a fast reaction. After you move, but before enemies at your new location engage you, exhaust track shoes. Test agility three. If you succeed, move to a connecting location. Okay, before we get to the ability, which seems awesome, a couple thoughts. I think the reason that footwear is a phantom slot, because feet could totally be a slot. Like, it's, yeah. they, could, they could put out a lot of shoes. I think the reason tarot is a slot and not footwear is because they have no plans for a footwear basic weakness. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the difference between this. Yeah, I this... mean, you know, what about, like, athlete's foot? Um, there's, like, various, like, fungi that you can get down there. The, uh... The Velcro Nomicon. <laughs> <laughs> Foot binding also? Like, that's a, hmm. that's a bad thing that can happen to your feet. Okay, well, like I said, I don't think that those are going to happen, because if so, there would be a, a footwear slot so that they would compete. Um, and then the, the other thought that I see here is this box seems to be... So static, uh, like static bo stat boosts have always been really controlled by them being mostly just on allies and occasionally on accessories. You can pretty much only have two cards. Getting them on a new slot and then this one, which is another, like, not a slot slash new slot, they're really letting loose with the permanent the, the permanent stat boosts. Yeah, so we went from, like, agility being normally, like, four, maybe five if you've got Wendy with Pete Sylvester, to now, like, pretty easily you can have Rita with, like, seven agility by just taking this and the, the tarot or this and Pete. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, agility is getting, like, off the charts. Right. Yeah. Yeah, with the tarot and this, man, and Pete, Rita can, can have a flat eight agility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and do damage every and time. And none of those hates. are competing slots or anything. So you don't have to take charisma. Um, you just have to spend one XP on the tarot. Um, also, Damn. just the action efficiency. Like, so let's say you do get up to six, seven, eight agility. You're almost always going to succeed at this. So it lets you just move right through enemies. Yeah, so this ability we've barely even talked about yet. Being able to get a double move, basically get a free move, which is usually just a seeker thing. This is, I think, the first time Survivor or... Yeah, I think the first time Survivor has gotten to do it at all. And then getting to leapfrog enemies, essentially, by doing it before they engage you is nuts. Yeah, so have you, have you ever played with Shortcut 2? I have. I love so that card. <laughs> if you get a Shortcut 2 on a hub location, it mm -hmm. feels so good. Yeah, you get so, so many free actions Track Shoes lets you turn an enemy into a Shortcut 2. You just leave an enemy in the middle of the map and you just hop over it every turn. Well, you don't. Ha this doesn't have. This doesn't require an enemy to trigger. 
Oh, I thought it did. No, as long as you can pass an agility three test, which you can do pretty well because you're probably the seekers they okay. have decent agility and this gives you plus one, you get it all the move. This is like a level zero Pathfinder. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> Although I, I am kind of disappointed because I really like the idea of just keeping the enemy around so you can like jump over it. Like I'm I'm thinking like <laughs> like Mario when you jump on an enemy and then you bounce just off bounce it to the... to the next platform. Like I was thinking that you would use enemies that way. That's true. That's true. That would be pretty awesome. <laughs> okay, couple cards left. Act of Desperation is a zero cost seeker at, oh, excuse me seeker event. That's a tactic and a gambit. As an additional cost to play Act of Desperation, choose and discard an item asset that takes up at least one hand slot from your hand or play area. Fight, you get plus X combat and deal plus one damage for this attack, where X is the chosen asset's printed resource cost. If you succeed and that asset was in your play area, gain X resources. Okay, first of all, this card is a flavor win. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the fact that you can just take whatever the hell item is in your hand and chuck it out of desperation <laughs> at the monster coming your way. Is... Yeah, so this this art actually, it's really cool. It's this old lady like fighting off a monster with a shotgun, but it actually doesn't quite capture the flavor, like what the card really does, which is you're chucking a used flashlight at an right. enemy. You know? like, <laughs> I kind of wish she was just tossing some old crap at an enemy, you know, or like fighting them off with a track shoe. Like <laughs> That's true. Although that said, this card is amazing with guns that are out of ammo. True. Because you can discard from your play area yeah. and get its resources back, which is and guns are generally on the expensive side, so they're also giving you a really solid combat boost. Yeah. So Yorick absolutely loves this card. Yes. You just you chuck your expired guns uh, they do a bunch of damage, you get a bunch of resources, and you use that to play the gun, and it suddenly has ammo again. Yeah. So this is Rita's box. Is this a Rita card? Uh, you know, it's it's good enough that maybe it goes in, in all survivors. Um, she does have three fight, so you combine that three fight with a couple of fight from the item. And it's I think it's fine in Rita, but I think it's amazing in Yorick. And yeah. who else in this box can take survivor cards? Oh, good point. Wait, who? The rich boy, Preston. Oh, Preston Chan. <laughs> so, For a second I thought Diana, and then I'm like, nope, that's, <laughs> that's not right. Yeah, so, hmm. uh, you know, and he likes having a lot of money, so this helps him get back up to that, you know, 10 money threshold that he wants to be at. And he's probably more than most playing expensive assets. Yeah, so he's playing a lot of expensive assets, and he doesn't really have any other good way to fight. <laughs> so you put two of these in, in Preston, and yeah. there's at least, like, two turns where he can do a little fighting. Honestly, the fact that this can even the fact that this can even discard a card from your hand and get you those resources even though you never paid for it in the first place, it's hard to see not putting this into almost any deck that can take it. Yeah. <laughs> this card yeah. is nuts. Yeah. And then having it's a combat icon, so like you'd probably rather play it than use it for its combat pips, but still also having double icons yep. is like this card is ridiculous. Yeah, this this seems like maybe the strongest, like the, the one that will be in the most decks of all these cards. Yeah, I think so. Okay, one more guessing game. What do you think? Oh no, don't look. What do you think the Seeker skill is? Oh, um, so we have... Uh, We've got Doom in play makes it stronger, cards in hand makes it stronger, your health makes it stronger, and your money makes it stronger. What does that leave for survivors? Um, so we have one thing that's like an item so we have one thing that's an item that's really good and you want to just have out and another thing that tosses an item so probably something related to items but will it be like having a lot of items or having all your items in the discard yeah, so that's when you said tossing an item that's what put the study into my head my guess is it scales with the number of cards in your discard pile yeah that that would make a lot of sense <laughs> that like progressively gets better through the game it maybe doesn't necessarily represent you like doing better but it might it might yeah. mean you were playing a lot of awesome cards yeah um let's take a look all right so this skill is able bodied uh it's a guy throwing a javelin and i was way off <laughs> and it's uh it's attack and agility while you control two or fewer item assets uh, able body gains another attack and agility while you control one or fewer it gains two attack and two agility hmm so it, it works really well with act of desperation you toss you toss your item mm -hmm. um, and you toss the item with act of desperation as part of the cost so it would already be in play if you were to use able bodied on the check like the the item would already be out of play true 
Um, it doesn't work so well with track shoes unless, of course, you throw them away in your act of desperation. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, that would be, you could, for one big attack, throw, hit them with your shoe um, using act of desperation <laughs> and you would get plus three fight from the shoe's cost and you would get plus three fight from this if you only had one item left. Damn. So that would be, you know, heck of an attack for a really tough enemy. You got it all planned out for sure. I, whoa, I just noticed the the background of this. Yeah, art. I think it's a, it, looks, <laughs> it looks like an evil cat. An evil uh, cloud cat. With tentacles. Yeah, I just I, I just thought it was like a foggy background. I only just like, yep. the, the eyes really caught me off guard. What I was trying to say was the fact that the flavor of this card is around like a track star athlete, but it strikes me as... I don't know, the, the thing that makes me think it's not a great reader card is she's always going to want to wear her shoes and they're an item. Yep. So that's a little bit of an anti-synergy there. So it but bothers... But you are allowed to have one item with this. Oh, that's true. Well, you have one or fewer item assets. So as long as she doesn't want a weapon or, or anything yeah. like that, which she doesn't need, she can run away from everyone. Yeah. Okay, cool. I like it. That takes us to the other basic weakness in the box. We saw the tarot card earlier. There's a second one. The 13th Vision, basic weakness, it's an omen. It says, Revelation, put the 13th Vision into play in your threat area. Investigators at your location fail ties during all skill tests. And as two actions, you can discard the 13th Vision. And interestingly, card design by the Council of 13 at Arkham Knights 2017. The first 12 were false. So uh, did you ever see the like beta version of this that came out of Arkham Knights? Nope. No. I I recall that it was an asset. So hmm. this actually changed from what they designed there. And I think that's good. I never understood why it was an asset. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I think the logic... I, I talked to some people who were involved in the, in the design. I think that the logic was that your allies can't trigger the discard ability if it's an asset. They can if it's a weakness in your threat area, I mm -hmm. think. Um, seems like a needless restriction. Why mm -hmm. remove teamwork? So I like I like the change. What do you think of the the so, ability isn't the right word on a weakness? What, so do, you, what do you think of the Practically, is there any real difference between fail ties and everyone at your location gets minus one to all their skills? No. So then isn't there uh, art? Okay, there's one difference when you're trying to pass by by a certain amount. Mm. Right? Yeah. That's, that's the only true. time? That's true. And well, okay. But like there's already a weakness that's like you personally get minus one to all your skills. This one is yeah. everyone at your location, for mo for the most part, gets minus one to all their skills. Yeah. So it seems like 98% worse than that one. So it's pretty bad. <sighs> yeah, it actually does seem pretty bad. Fail ties doesn't sound that bad like to your brain, but when you think about it, yeah, it's basically minus one to all skills. It doesn't hurt you trying to fail or trying to pass by more, so that's good. It does, though, the other uh, difference that occurred to me is you fail tests of zero difficulty than you would normally pass. If oh, flashlight yeah. or something takes an investigation yep. down to zero, you no longer pass. So, yeah, this one seems rough. I guess, you know, if you're failing, like, uh, rotting remains and stuff, it's not as bad. Like, if you draw this in the upkeep and so you have to deal with it for the whole encounter phase, mm -hmm. at least a lot of things are, like, fail by this amount. Um, so it's not going to affect those. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, definitely one that someone's probably going to take care of, like, the turn after. Like... It's hard to imagine anyone leaving this for more than one encounter phase, you know? Yeah, at the same time, I'm kind of a fan of the weaknesses that don't do damage or horror to you and just take actions to, to clear. Like drawing the sign, I, I mean, sometimes you really hate it. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. makes you discard five cards, but a lot of the time it's kind of harmless. And I can see this a lot of the time falling into that bucket too. Yeah, but like, you're, you're going to fail so many skills. Like, you spend an yeah. action... To, and several resources to boost one of your skills. So aren't you going to spend two actions to boost all of your skills? <laughs> that, true. Yeah, that's that's pretty rough. And then the fact that this is actually worse the more players you have, because the yeah. more, more likely it is to, to affect more of your, your team. Okay, pretty rough. I don't, um, I don't, I mean, I, I like that they exist just fine, but I wouldn't really want to get either of the weaknesses from this box. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this one, um, at least, you know, one of the things, if you're new to the game, uh, it is allowed to click someone else's weakness off them. So mm -hmm. uh, if if Brandon were to draw this and he drew it at the end of his turn, I could spend two actions to 
uh, get rid of it. So I think this is one that, you know, in most games, someone is pretty quickly going to jump on it. Um, but, you know, the big problem is just you often draw weaknesses in the upkeep phase, and then you have to deal with a whole encounter phase. Yeah. Uh, with, with minus one, with potentially everyone yeah. minus one, essentially. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's rough. You're right. I, I like that point that because it affects everyone, it incentivizes your friends more <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. to help you clear your weakness. They're either going to just move the heck out of there yeah. or they're going to click it off you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It could go one of two ways. They either clear it from you or they no longer want to help you with your enemy. <laughs> huh. Okay, that does it. That's every card in the box. What do you think? Uh, you know, I'm pretty excited to play with some of these cards. You know, we got some weird investigators. I think... Um, you know, some of them I'm more excited about than others. Um, we are firmly in the realm of, and maybe it's, maybe we've been here since Carcosa, maybe this isn't new, but every investigator in this box feels super different. <laughs> and particularly, I think more than ever, they feel really kind of brain bending to even figure out what they're supposed to do and how to build for them. You have, these are some of the first characters I think we've seen that really their function doesn't match the color of their, <laughs> the border of their card. Right? Yep, definitely. <laughs> so it's going to be really interesting to dig into, and I'm, I'm curious both to play them and to see what people come up with. Yeah, no, I'm super excited. I think probably the first one I'll build will be a Joe deck, but I, I really want to build Diana and Preston as well. Yeah, I'm excited about Rita. I haven't, um, I enjoy Yorick, but all in all, I'm not a big Survivor fan. Mm. But I really enjoyed Finn. Like, you finally give me someone who can really evade and excel at that and show how valuable it is to exhaust a lot of enemies often. And I've really enjoyed that playstyle. So I'm looking forward to trying that in red. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how long this video has been. I feel like we've gotten pretty long, but you have a few more minutes to uh, check in on the start of the story. Yeah, of while course. we're here. All right. So again, I think I said this at the beginning, but we're not planning to spoil anything significant. We just want to kind of poke our head into the campaign log and get a taste of, of what we're what we're looking at. We're not going to go past the setup of anything. Um, it starts off with an H.P. Lovecraft quote from *The Dreams in the Witch House*. The hidden cults to which these witches belonged often guarded and handed down surprising secrets from elder forgotten aeons. It was by no means impossible that Keziah had actually mastered the art of passing through dimensional gates. Hmm. Okay, right there, it sounds like we're leaving Arkham. Dimensional gates. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Damn, I wanted to just be in Arkham. <laughs> It's all right. Um, I actually only know that name, Keziah, because I listened to the Drawn to the Flame podcast where they talked about, <laughs> talked about the lore that may feed into this campaign. Hi, Drawn to the Flame hosts. Love your show. <laughs> That's one of the classic Lovecraft witch characters. Um, very cool. I think it's likely that we'll see her here. Taking a peek at the rules, it explains tarot slots, alerts, and story cards and Joe's hunch deck. The interesting thing is Haunted. Yeah. Yeah. You want to uh, check out the Haunted rules? Sure. So Haunted is a new ability that appears on some locations. Each time an investigator fails a skill test while investing in a location, after applying all results for that skill test, the investigator must resolve all Haunted abilities on that location. A location is haunted for the purpose of other card effects if it has at least one Haunted ability. I like it. I'm... I'm a fan of keywords, especially in cooperative games when there's no need to like go into a tournament knowing what all 40 of the possible keywords you might see yep. do. So I like to see them keywording things. This is an effect that we've seen before. When you fail investigating at this location, this bad thing happens to you. And the fact that they keyword it means that, and it, it even calls out here, that other things can refer to it. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because it's not really new. Like we, We've definitely seen a number of locations. Right. Um, although a lot of them... Well, yeah, so, oh, this is just investigating. So it's not fighting on the location. Mm -mm. It's not dodging on the location. But yeah, we've seen that before. Um, but yeah, and I'm excited to see what things will refer to all haunted locations. You know, if it'll be everyone on a haunted location has to test their will or, or whatever. Also, the fact that the keyword is haunted tells us something more about the campaign, right? The story. Like, we, le we learned from that first quote that it was about witches and now also ghosts. Yeah, Or yeah. What, what else haunts? I guess ghouls haunt. Yeah, so, but... you know, it's good timing. Um, there's The Haunting of Hill House was a very popular it's show true. last it's year. It's true, I loved that. <laughs> um, you know, so we had Carcosa kind of turned, uh, you know, tied in with True Detective. Now you have <laughs> this with Haunting of Hill House. So, you know, definitely they're, they're on the pulse of the media. Right, right. So then we have this prologue scenario. Yeah, for the first time, there's a scenario zero in this box and you don't play it with your starting deck, right? In fact, it says don't even choose your investigators or assemble your decks yet. 
OK. So is this a good time to look at one of those? Yeah. I, I, I pulled one out. We can take a look at Gabriella Mizra. My understanding is that she's only going to be used one time, and it's in this prologue. She has, OK, pretty reasonable skills, three willpower, two intellect, four combat, and one agility. She's a veteran and has reaction after an enemy attacks you, even if that attack was canceled. <laughs> That's a nice touch. Discover one clue at your location. Limit once per round. And as an Elder Sign effect, plus one heal, one damage, and one horror. That's an Elder Sign effect I'd love <laughs> to see on a character I could actually play. Yeah. That seems really strong. Her stats are eight health and four horror, though. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, that is the lowest, I think, horror number we've ever seen printed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It is the same average as Calvin and Lola, but it's the lowest sanity we've seen. Yeah, right. Um, so on the back it says setup. You begin play in the Victorian halls. I, I, I figure that would be in the prologue. <laughs> Place one damage on the Spectral Watcher. <laughs> Again, this is all kind of nonsense right now, but you can look forward to this when you dive in. Search the gathered cards for one copy of Fate of All Fools and put it into play in your threat area, and you begin with one resource instead of five. Oh, that hurts. Ooh, okay. Yeah. And then, this is new, starting play area. You start with a 45 automatic with two ammo tokens <laughs> remaining. Oh, I love that. It, that is awesome. That tells a story right there about what's already been going on right before this takes place. And with physical training, okay. And then, and I actually peeked before we turned the camera on, I peeked at the rules. These investigators don't have a deck at all, but they do have an opening hand. So you get one group of cards yeah. that you can play. And hers includes first aid, guard dog, evidence, dodge, extra ammunition level one, and two copies of Delay the Inevitable, which was one of the Circle yeah. Undone cards we just looked at. So it's all core set cards and Circle Undone cards, which makes yeah. sense. Um, and you know what, Let, let's, let's read her little backstory too. A former member of the Haganah, I don't know what that is, do you? Uh, is it like Israeli special forces or something? Like her name kind of sounds like it. Sure. I yeah, I could see that. But it's not one that I've heard of. It's probably something badass. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll be happy with that. A former member of the Haganah, Gabriella Mizra, now works private security for wealthy homeowners. Yosef Meiger, a man who takes his confidentiality quite seriously, has retained Gabriella to make sure there are no problems during tonight's event. But even she is not prepared for what is to come. Tonight's event. So another dinner party scenario, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I hope that one of these four has fine clothes. Yes, right. No, they can't. That's not a corset card. Oh. I'm pretty sure they won't. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. I mean, maybe one will have track shoes. <laughs> uh, so the other thing we glean from this is that... Nope, I lost my train of thought. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got it back. All right, the other thing we gleaned from this, so I was wondering actually, again, kind of after listening to that Lord podcast, whether because of the history of witches and witch trials and everything in uh, the American Northeast, whether the prologue would be t would take place in like the 1600s or something. Oh, and yeah. It clearly doesn't. She yeah. has a gun with two bullets in yeah. it. Like, yeah. it, it's clearly a, I was going to say a modern story. Uh -huh. That's not true either. It's probably takes place right before the, uh -huh. we, we dive into the campaign with our regular investigators. All right, I'm stoked. Yeah, I love the idea that it's like, it's take, like jumping in in the middle of probably a battle if she has two bullets left. And I'm, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious if one of the other investigators will start with like a bunch of damage or something. True, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, any final words on the box? I'm, I'm really excited to get into it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm both psyched to like build decks with these new investigators as well as like check out this crazy prologue thing. Um, and yeah, it should be a lot of fun. And I think I am the most excited for this campaign on a like narrative conceptual level that I've been yet. I think Carcosa is my favorite campaign and it still might be after this, but I was not excited going into it. I didn't know that much about it or anything, but getting to know Arkham more in depth, the Silver Twilight Lodge, witches and ghosts, those are like things that the game hasn't done very much of yet, and I'm really excited to see. Yeah, one thing I'm super excited about, and if you're a crazy spoiler freak, you can turn it off now, but <laughs> all of the agendas uh, seem to be tarot related, and they have this like crazy font that like looks different, and it seems like there's going to be maybe more of a thematic connection in the storyline that the agendas tell throughout the campaign. Right, yeah, the tarot cards aren't just player cards, they're integral to the story, or at least they're integral to the way the story is told, Yeah, which is awesome. Uh, on that note, 
Should we turn this off and go play some Arkham? Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. Um, if you enjoyed this, or if you didn't enjoy this, please let us know. This is our first foray into just talking about games on Optimal Play instead of playing them. And it's not going to replace playing the games by any means. That will still be what we usually do. But hopefully we'll do more of this if uh, people are enjoying it. I had a good time. Yeah, me too. Uh, if you're a fan of Arkham Horror and haven't checked out our live play series of Arkham Horror yet, as of the time that we're filming this, four of them are up, the first whole campaign and the Dunwich Legacy. Unfortunately, that's not with Steven. That is me and two other friends who have never played Arkham Horror except for those videos. So it's fun to watch them stumble around. <laughs> so check those out if you think you'd enjoy that. And we've got uh, several more films and coming up shortly. We're well into that campaign now, even though only the first one is up. And it, uh, it's gotten hairy. <laughs> so I hope you have fun watching those too. With that, let's say goodnight. Thank you for watching. And until next time, be optimal. Thanks, everyone.